Hi everyone, I'm Christy Gordson and welcome to Washington Grown. When the flowers start to bloom, you'll see them buzzing around everywhere and they're a huge asset to many Washington crops. This episode, all about bees. We'll head to one of the hottest restaurants in Spokane, The Wandering Table, where we'll whip up a tasty honey dessert. You can really taste a little bit of that champagne. Yeah, and then the honey finish right at the and end And then there. the honey, yeah. And the declining bee population has been in the news lately. Tomas will chat with a bee farmer about these ever-important pollinators and what their biggest threat is today. Then we're making some traditional mead, or honey wine, and giving it a try. It's very crisp. Nothing at all like I originally thought. All that and much more on Washington Grown. Are you ready to cook me up? Okay, I don't have the hang of this. So this is where we get our water. <laughs> Cheers. Hopefully they won't eat my shoelaces. <laughs> Our first stop today is in Spokane at The Wandering Table. This Americana restaurant is known for putting a delicious twist on simple dishes, and the food is served family style, meant to be shared. I really like the fact the menu constantly changes. Whenever we come in, there's something new and exciting to try. What I love is food that you can see and know where it's coming from. It's super simple, but then there's all this unique flavor in it too. It was really good, really fresh, a lot of good flavors going on and a lot of different options that you could have. It seems like every time I come in here I've got a new favorite. You can walk in off the street or make it a date night, it's, it's a perfect place. I sat down with chef and owner Adam Hegstead to learn more about this popular spot. The Wandering Table. Where did you come why up is with it that? Not wandering? Yeah, why is it not wandering? Um, we used to do a pop-up restaurant where we'd travel around to do a restaurant in different places, about 30 people at a time. Then eventually we decided to just have a brick and mortar restaurant. What inspires you as a chef? It's the season, number one. I mean, I, we look all over the world. We read a lot of cookbooks and see what other restaurants are doing around the world, but mostly it's the season. We start there always. We see what's gonna come into season, what's coming in the back door, and then we start writing the menus from there. We do a, a chef's tasting here so where we have things that are kind of the best of the season, things that are looking really great right now is what we serve. So. so why is that important to you? So I think it kind of tells like a time and a place of where you're at. So when people come to Spokane, they can have a Spokane experience, they can have a place that represents the area. Later, Chef Adam is teaching me how to make honey champagne sauvignon. Yum. Now, Tomas is in Ritzville, where beekeeper Eric Olson of Olson's Honey is delivering his traveling pollinating bees. Eric and his bees travel to farms all over the Pacific Northwest to make sure their crops are pollinated and ready for the season. Now, they might be small, but these awesome insects are the key to thriving agriculture for many farmers all over our state. You know, I love bees. They're fascinating creatures. So tell me a little bit more about this cool thing you get to work with. We are primarily pollinators. Uh, what we're going to be looking at today is seed pollination on canola fields. We're moving the bees out to those canola fields right now and setting them in place. The canola is just about ready to start blooming right now. And which is the perfect conditions to bring right. them out here. Exactly. How long of a life cycle does a bee have? Uh, summertime when they're working hard, about 30 days. Really? That's it? That's it. That's the worker bee. Uh, worker bees are all female. The females do the work. If somebody came to you and said, is the bee important? Well, what would your response be to that? <laughs> uh, the bee is incredibly important. Uh, one out of every three bites of food that we eat today is directly pollinated by honeybees. Apricots, cherries, pears, apples, carrot seed, radish seed, onion seed, and then we eat meat. Well, the, the meat's got to eat alfalfa and stuff like that. Right. And that's all got to be pollinated also. Eric says the bee's number one threat today is the Varroa mite, a parasite that's causing honeybee colonies to steadily decline. The Varroa mite sucks on that larva for sustenance and it deforms that bee. So when that bee comes out of the cell, she's already deformed, she's already compromised. Right. And that is what causes the bee population to decline so badly. Uh, the mites 
clamp onto the bee and they suck on the bee and they ride around on the bee. Put it in perspective, if you had a basketball zipped right into your body, that's exactly what the relative size is wow. for the bee. That's how big that Varroa mite is. My goodness, so what are we doing to battle this Varroa mite? We've got a couple of really good things going at Washington State University. Using uh, CO2 to kill the mite, and what we would do is use the CO2 in the winter time when the beehive is shut down, we would put it into controlled atmosphere storage, put those girls to sleep, and kill that Varroa mite. Uh, okay. And then also working on a fungus that looks very promising right now, and that fungus would be for during the summer to control the mite. Those are exciting things. So we're on to something, but there's still more work that's that needs right. to be done. That's right. That's exactly right. The business is just exciting. It's very busy. It's just a big challenge to keep up with all of it. it sounds like we need the bees, and it sounds like the bees need you. That's it. That's <laughs> so let's exactly go, uh, right. Let's go unload some hives and check it out. OK. All right. Now we just set them down. We'll just do a little check here, put a little smoke on them. OK. Oh, wow, look at that. Wow. And there we are. That's Look a nice, that. nice, nice hive. Look at that hive. These are babies here. Okay. And it's surrounded by honey. Which is all this that I'm yes. seeing here. Yes, that's right. Wow. The one thing I can guarantee you about these things, if your hive has Varroa mite, it will die. We have not had a pesticide uh, problem for better than 10 years. The new softer chemistries are easier on the bees and the growers are busting their rear to uh, protect the bees. They're doing a good job. They should be commended. It's so fun to be this up close to them and just see them work. And they've just got such a organized way of doing things. It's so amazing. How long will these bees be out here to do what they need to do naturally and About pollinate? So it'll take a month to pollinate this field. Right. Okay. Right. Then you come pick them up and take them to another field. That's right. Look at that. Delicious. Or should I say be delicious? <laughs> Before modern honey apiaries, gathering honey and getting it from hive to bottle was dangerous work as someone had to climb a tree and face a swarm of bees. Nowadays, we can stroll through a farmer's market or supermarket and choose from a number of honey options. Lighter colored honey generally has a milder flavor than more robust dark colored honey. Pure honey has no added preservatives or additives. Raw honey and pure processed honey both contain similar levels of trace minerals, vitamins, and antioxidants, with raw honey having a higher pollen count. Processed honey is favored by most people because of its less cloudy appearance and delayed crystallization. People know that honey comes from bees, but few understand that honey begins as flower nectar. The type of nectar gathered contributes to the distinctive flavor of the honey. The nectar is altered by the bee's enzymes and turned into honey, then placed into storage capsules called combs. Both bees and people use honey's simple sugar for fuel, but humans have found many creative ways to utilize honey, such as adding it to salad dressings, sauces, glazes, granolas, or drizzling it over muffins, and pancakes, and pears. One of my personal favorites is honey roasted nuts. And for many people, a dab of honey added to their tea or coffee introduces flavors that sugar can't provide. It takes millions of pollinating flowers to make a pound of honey, and every day millions of people enjoy honey. Thank goodness we don't have to climb trees anymore to gather it. Coming up, we're back at the Wandering Table in Spokane to make a honey champagne sabayon brulee. It is really light and delicate. I'm here with Steve Shepard from Washington State University, and you are an entomologist here at WSU. Yes, yes. And yeah. you have some orchards and mm -hmm. lots of bees. How many bees? We usually have around 200 colonies, and then we move some of them into the university orchard for pollination of tree fruits. Yeah, important. Yeah. One of the, the yeah. things that we need bees for. Yes, indeed. How important are they? They're, they're quite important if you like to eat fruits and vegetables. If you only care about eating wheat and rice, uh, you don't really need bees. But, but a lot of the vegetables and uh, fruits require pollination, nut crops. 
and also things like alfalfa, this, the seed production is dependent on insect pollination, so it's really important for uh, milk and dairy products and meat production. So tell me about um, the problems that the bees have been facing. We've heard a lot about it in the news over the last several years, it seems, this colony collapse disorder, yeah. CCD. Tell me about that. Well, beekeepers and honeybees have had problems for 20 or 30 years, but Starting in about 2008, beekeepers began losing larger numbers of bees than they, they were used to. So there's been a lot of research uh, directed at trying to find out the causes, and it appears to not be any one thing. It's not a new virus, it's not a new fungal pathogen, it's not that suddenly a new pesticide is being used that harms them. Instead, it seems to be when they're stressed with several things. Yeah. So you know, moving stress can be one. Improper nutrition. Honeybees have problems with a parasitic mite. And uh, you are doing all sorts of research involving bees. Yeah, we work on honeybee breeding and honeybee genetics here and, and some other issues related to colony health. What is exciting right now in the field of bee research? Well, there's a lot, but here at WSU, we're establishing a genetic repository where we can store for dozens or maybe even hundreds of years uh, honeybee genetic material, honeybee semen to use for breeding purposes. And most recently we were funded by the Washington State Tree Fruit Commission to go to the Tian Shan Mountains of Central Asia to uh, bring back semen of Apis mellifera pomonella, which is the honeybee that is adapted to apples. So apples originated in these mountains of Central Asia and this is the honeybee from that location. The idea is it would be a bee very well adapted for apple pollination mm -hmm. and it would work at cold temperatures. That's really amazing. For more information on agriculture in Washington, visit our website at wagrone.com. We're back in Spokane at the popular restaurant, The Wandering Table. So you can walk in off the street or make it a date night. It's, it's a perfect place to come eat. What I love is food that kind of you can see and know where it's coming from. It's super simple, but then there's all this unique flavor in it too. It was really good, really fresh, really um, a lot of good flavors going on and a lot of different options that you could have. I spoke with owner and head chef Adam Higstead about his influences for the trendy restaurant. What inspires you as a chef? It's the season, number one. I mean, I, we look all over the world. We read a lot of cookbooks and see what other restaurants are doing around the world, but mostly it's the season. We start there always. Um, we see what's going to come into season, what's coming in the back door, and then we start right in the menus from there. I mean, we really love Americana style food, so we kind of spin off a lot of those things, and so those are actually some of our most popular things. Now I'm heading in the kitchen with Chef Adam to cook up a delicious honey-inspired dessert. We're going to make... Honey champagne sauvignon. Sauvignon. That sounds very fancy. It sounds delicious. <laughs> it's really fancy, but it's pretty simple. It's, yeah. It's a very good recipe. Yeah. What do you? Is it going to be like a like a custard or a yogurt? Yeah. Type? So basically, it's a whipped custard. Okay. Then we're going to pour over fruit and let set, and then brulee it. Oh, that sounds delicious. Yeah. Okay. So what do we do first? All right. So we have some grapefruit here. I'm just going to cut up some of this fruit, and then we're going to macerate it in some honey and a little bit of mead wine, some honey wine. So we have some uh, fresh rhubarb. Fresh which rhubarb. Is from here. We finish cutting our fruit then dump it in a bowl and add some granulated honey. You can just use brown sugar too, that's Granulated fine. honey. Yeah. Now I've never, no, even, I've never heard of that before. Mm -hmm. Where do you find granulated honey? Um, they sell it at specialty markets um, or something like okay. that. Okay. We mix it all together, then set the fruit aside and start working on the Sauvignon. What we have here is we're gonna do, we're gonna start with the honey, okay. egg yolks, uh, we have some champagne here, some dry champagne some salt and we're just going to whisk that up until it makes uh, it's very fluffy and light okay. colored and thickens up a little and bit. And this so. time we're not using granulated honey. Yep, just regular honey. Regular honey. Yeah. We dump the honey into a bowl, add the egg yolks and a little champagne. All right. And then you whip so away. Then we're going to whip it, yep. We're just going to mix these, these together here and then we're going to put them over the water bath and cook them until it's light colored and uh, thickened up. Okay. Okay. So this is a... Uh, this is just a hot water. pan of hot water, yep. We continue whisking until the mixture has a sauce-like consistency. We're going to drop the fruit into the bowl. And some it's of all the fruit. juicy now. From yeah, you can kind of see yeah. the sugar is melted. It has its own sort of sauce in there. Okay. And then the sauce is going to go on top. Oh, and it's beautiful. It's just foamy and... Okay. Wow. Okay. Then we're just going to kind of shake that down a little bit. Make sure it settles in the sure. fruit. 
And then we'll put that right into the fridge. Then we put it in the fridge to cool for a few hours. Okay. okay. Finished so, product. Yep, just gonna take some sugar. This is just gra regular granulated sugar. Okay. Sprinkle a little bit on top, just like a creme brulee. Same process. Mm -hmm. Then we're gonna and torch it. Torch. Yep. Just gonna brown the sugar up a little bit. And this is just gonna create that nice... Nice crust. Crust. Yeah. Then we're just gonna take a tiny bit of this granola. And this will give a, a nice crunch when you're eating it too. Mm -hmm. My mouth is watering. This looks <laughs> so good. Are we ready? We're ready. Okay, let's try it. Got a spoon? Okay. Get berries. That is so good. You can really taste a little bit of that champagne. Yeah, and then the honey finish right at the and end And then there. the honey, yeah. yeah. You're right. It's so light and delicate. I could eat three bowls. <laughs> All right, I'll make you a couple more. Yeah. <laughs> I'll start on this one. <laughs> That is so good. Thank you so Thank much. You. To get the recipe for the Wandering Tables Honey Champagne Sauvignon, log on to our website at wagrone.com. Coming up, we're heading to a meadery to make some traditional mead and taking it around to people in Spokane to see what they think of it. When they say wow, you know you got it. like that. Honey can be used in many different ways, from sweet to savory. Today, we're meeting up with Jeremy Kinsel, the owner of Hierophant Meadery in Spokane. He's showing us how to make one of the oldest alcoholic drinks known to man, mead, which is made from honey and water. So mead is honey wine. It's honey wine, and that's what a lot of people will call it, although it's properly defined as mead. Mead, and mead's been around for centuries. Oh, right? millennia at this millennia, point. Yeah. Um, some of the very earliest human art includes a man with a bee for a head. So we've been around the bees, we've really revered them for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And we've been making mead for the better part of 8,000 years. Now when people, when I think of mead, I think of like old European or something, you know, sloshing their big, you know, mugs and <laughs> that sort of uh -huh. thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, and they're drinking horns and everything else. Yeah, that's yeah. very traditional. And that's certainly what most people think of. They think of Renaissance fairs. Yeah. They think of uh, things like that. And they think of a very sweet mead, usually. Sweet, yeah. Um, ours is quite a bit drier. Um, we're essentially along the lines of a dry Riesling. Mead is making a comeback. <laughs> the interest is exploding, um, and the number of meaderies is exploding. Um, we've been open three years, and the number of meaderies has doubled since we came into the business. Our first step in making mead is to dilute the honey with water. It's just raw honey. There's actually little bee bits in there and everything else. Um, <laughs> yeah, little bits of okay. honeycomb, everything else. <laughs> um, and so yeah, we'll just dump it in the hot water and we'll mix it up uh, to get it in the solution and we'll put it into our fermenter. Okay. So. I'm just gonna hang out and watch <laughs> you do your thing. Woo! It smells delicious. So explain to people who don't know what mead is exactly. So at its simplest, a traditional mead is just honey, yeast, and water. That's all that goes into it. Then we dump our honey solution into the fermenting tank, and Jeremy adds some raspberries for a fruity flavor. Then we dump in yeast and hops to start the fermenting process. We're just going to throw, it, gonna we're gonna throw it right in the top. We're, so okay. we're going to pitch it in. Here we go. Pitching. After a couple of weeks, when the mead is finished fermenting, Jeremy infuses it with some herbs to add a little variety and fragrance. So the big part of this, of course, is honey. It is. We buy all of our honey from local apiaries. Right now, we actually buy from Spokane and Lincoln County, so within 50 miles of the meadery here is where all of our honey comes from. And uh, what we get from Sprague, Washington, which is a little further out, is much more buttery and light and really mild. So. We use different ones for different wines. Obviously, these bees are very important to what you do. And, <laughs> and it's and, crucial, yeah. And, and you want to save the honeybees, too. It's like a mission. Oh, absolutely. That's why we went into this business and why we went into making a meadery happen. Um, we saw their decline. We saw a chance to, to bring value to them in people's eyes, to really help them to connect with why they're so important in a way that they enjoy as well. So drink mead and save the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That is really good. It is, like you said, it's very crisp. Well, thank you so much. Absolutely. For thank you for coming up. Letting me try this and opening up a whole new world. Oh, hey. Who knew? It's our pleasure, of course. Enjoy. Hmm.
Now, Tomas is taking some traditional meat from the meadery and serving it up to people at Left Bank Wine Bar in Spokane. So, Abby, have you ever had mead before? No. Mead? Mead. No. When I ask you about mead, what comes to your mind? Like an old British or English thing? Like really old, dark bars from years and years and years ago. <laughs> A really long time ago. That's the only time I've heard of it. You know, whereas wine would be fermented with grapes and beer would be fermented with wheat, this is actually made from honey. Okay, so just give that a sip. Describe what you guys are, are drinking. Four here. Cheers. Have some more. What do you taste? Wow. Wow. See, that's great. When they say wow, you know you've got it. Like that. Light and smooth. No, I think it's really quite mild. It does taste like kind of a port wine, but not as strong. There's a crisp dryness. I say a light honey flavor, a little sweet. It's actually very refreshing. Would you get this if it was on the menu? Absolutely, yes. I would get this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the tastiest thing I've ever put in my mouth. Probably, yeah. huh? Yeah, that's definitely the best thing. Just, <laughs> definitely. in the kitchen at Second Harvest and I'm with Kristen and it looks like we're gonna make some sort of granola which is one of my favorite things to eat in the morning. I love Mine it. too. Yeah. And we're making good morning granola. Good morning granola. That's what do we call it that? <laughs> I sing the song from good Singing morning, in the Rain. Good, good morning. morning. <laughs> <laughs> to wake <laughs> them up. That is so, so cute. One day I just ad libbed in a song and said, that is so Good cute. morning, granola. <laughs> and so now we all <laughs> call it Good Morning Granola. Your kids are going to have the best memories <laughs> of you when they grow up. I, I just love it. Okay, what do we need to do first? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to have you quarter some dried apricots okay. for me. And then I'm going to add our um, old fashioned oats okay. and some chopped walnuts. And we're just quartering. Yeah, okay. you're just gonna quarter them. And some that. craisins. I like how you're very specific when you tell me what to do. <laughs> Instead of, Christy, why don't you chop Not those? Like that. <laughs> Christy, quarter the <laughs> apricots, please. We know each other. Okay, so and then then I added some just pepitas. In there? Okay. Have you seen these before? They're kind of fun. I have, but are, are they pumpkin seeds? They are, they're okay. pumpkin seeds. And I like them because they give it just a nice little color pop. Yeah, in the they do. But here's the real star of our granola. The honey. The honey. Really? Yes. Why do you like honey with your granola? It is the perfect sweetness. Is it? My mom would make granola sometimes. It's my grandma's recipe. Mm -hmm. And it had a lot of corn syrup and sugar and right. it was delicious. Yeah. But when I, you know, wanted to start making my own granola, then I wanted to kind of make it a little healthier but still have that perfect mm -hmm. amount of sweetness to it. So I found that honey was just the just perfect right. way to do it. After we combine the honey with some canola oil, we add in a pinch of salt and whisk it all together. A lot of people kind of think that granola is fattening and, and full of like lots of sugar, but this this is, has very little, sh I mean, very little oil, and but you kind of need that, don't you? You do, it's gonna help it brown mm -hmm. up and really stick together. But you're right, a lot of the prepared granola that mm -hmm. you buy at the store, yeah. they can have a lot of added lot of sugar stuff. and fat. Yeah. Can I have those in here? Yes. But the other benefit of making this yourself is that it's a really cost-effective way mm -hmm. to make a lot of granola. Why is granola so expensive, I, I wonder? I don't know. I don't know either, because it's just simple, basic. Do you wanna mix that all together for us? Yeah. Once the ingredients are mixed, Kristen pours the liquid on top and we mix them together. It kind of takes a little bit of elbow work because you want to smash all of that honey until oh, it gets okay. nice and incorporated. Okay. You can use really? a stand mixer with a paddle attachment and it's oh. done in a snap. Okay. Sometimes I just don't want more dishes, so I just do it by hand. Sure, absolutely. But my kids like this job too. Sure. And then they do a little quality control. Mm -hmm. Love it. <laughs> absolutely. Just make sure it tastes good, Mom. Yeah. <laughs> and how do you like to eat your granola? 
I like mine with Greek yogurt. Mm -hmm. And my kids like theirs with milk. Oh yeah. So I'm we kind a big of yogurt girl. Are you yogurt? Yeah. What's your ultimate granola? What well, the it? granola that my family brings is is chock full of nuts. Has lots oh. of nuts in it, but it has the pepitas in it, and um, we use honey and syrup. Oh, so. granola is really versatile. Yeah. So sometimes you can add um, peanut butter or sure. almond butter, mm -hmm. different kinds of oils and flavors. And like you said, the different kinds of honeys, you can add spices and tons of different kinds of dried fruits right. and really get a different taste. I like that. It looks, what do you think? It looks perfect. Okay. We spread our granola out on a cookie sheet and throw it in the oven to bake. Okay, we have some cooled off granola yes. out of the oven. Looks golden and delicious. So you'll see, it kind of sticks a little bit. Oh yeah. And so you can just kind of bring it up in sections. Mm -hmm. I like my granola that has some of those big chunks. Okay. So you can just kind of use your hands. Sure. If you want it all to be in tiny pieces, you could sure. turn it right as soon as it gets out of the oven. Okay. But we let it cool so that we could still get some larger sized pieces. And since we both like yogurt, yeah. we brought some some Greek yogurt. Strawberry Greek yeah. yogurt today. We scoop some of our yogurt in a bowl, add some granola, and dig in. Here we go. Mmm, it's nice and crunchy. Mm -hmm. And not too sweet. I like how honey, it seems to, that you always get that nice aftertaste with honey. You do. Just that sweet, deep, kind of a mellow, mellow flavor mellow to sweetness. it. Mellow mm. sweetness. Good fuel for your day. Mm hmm. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> To get Kristen's recipe for Good Morning Granola, visit our website at wagrown.com. We hope the next time you see a bee landing on a flower or taste some delicious honey, that you appreciate the bees and all of their hard work a little more. That's it for this episode of Washington Grown. Thanks for watching.